The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Today we gather as one people, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a church not divided but united in the spirit of Christ who makes us one. This is a special day in which we celebrate the power of the church united. And I invite you to contemplate the verse from Exodus chapter 17. Is the Lord among us or not? As we contemplate that verse, let us now prepare our hearts for worship. So I would invite you to, as you're able, to stand with us and say our opening sentences. Today we gather together around God's table, for we are the people of God. We differ in language, custom, and tradition, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ. For there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We are one and Holy Spirit. Let us worship God. And so would you help me pray this opening prayer together? You can find it in the bulletin there. Holy God, your reach extends to every person, every nation, offering grace, forgiveness, and hope. Your saving embrace draws us to you and to each other. We are, we are your children, grateful for a place at your feast, humbled by your love, generosity, rejoicing in the beauty found in each other. We praise you for this day, for this moment, for this spirit of yours, which makes us one. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please join in singing hymn number 463, Lift Every Voice and Sing, it's found in the Blue Presbyterian Hymnal.
Please join me in the prayer confession, which is printed in your bulletin. Almighty God, we confess that we have not been in your faithful church. We are a fractured body. We are divided as a nation. We are segregated within our communities. We are alienated from ourselves. We have lost sight of one of the commandments you gave to us to love and, and to love one another. Forgive us and help us to forgive one another. Redeem us and make us one so that we may abide in the grace of your Holy Spirit together through Jesus Christ our Lord. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old life has passed away and a new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. may be seated. I invite those who'd like to to come forward for our children's message to sit down here next to Miss Wendy.
I am not Reverend Rick Smith, but I'm going to read his part right now. Rick Smith is one of our amazing bivocational pastors from Second Christian, a beloved member of our ministerial association. So we have, we hold him in prayer and in mercy and grace today in his busy schedule. So I invite you as we attend to God's word uh, to pray with me for God's spirit to illuminate us and to give us wisdom as we hear what the Bible says to us from Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 through 7. Listen for God's word. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us something water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take your hand in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so. In the sight of the elders of Israel, he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Merciful and loving creator, we thank you for this day, for this time in which your spirit has gathered us together from all different places, situations. We pray that you would unite us. Remind us of our common need for grace. Remind us of our common need for one another, for community, for connection. Remind us of the true purpose and meaning of our life and our true purpose and meaning in you. God bless the one who brings the word today. We pray your spirit would be with Evan Rowe and the word that he brings us. Bless the hearing of this word. May our hearts be fertile ground for the seed which you scatter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we have some special music brought to us by Miss Wendy Young from St. Matthew AME. Sorry, Wendy Young Hale. Yeah. <laughs>
thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> this will be good. Don't worry. <laughs> now that you've been to church. You know, it's dangerous. I'm looking around. I don't see a clock. It's dangerous to let a Baptist in the pulpit without a clock in front of him. <laughs> But we started church at least 30 minutes early, so that adds 30 minutes to my time, right? I'm saying, I'm saying. I want to invite you to turn with me uh, as we read our, our scripture this morning. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20, 21, verses 23 to 32. Matthew 21, 23 to 32. When he entered the temple, he is Jesus. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. And they said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. Have you ever noticed that about Jesus? When you ask him a question, he responds with a question right back. He said, I will ask you one question question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you the answer. I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus' question, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they, the chief priests and the elders, they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, well, then why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Hmm. And he said to them, neither will I tell you then by what authority I'm doing these things. And then he told them this parable. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go ahead and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father then went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to these, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Someone with a lot of time on their hands one estimated that, once estimated that during his ministry, Jesus asked 307 questions. He was asked 183 questions by other people. And he gave direct answers to exactly three questions. Very early on, John the Baptist asked Jesus, are you the one we've been waiting for or should we keep looking? Then these chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they asked Jesus one question after another, after another, after another, some of which we've read this morning. And then finally, sitting in front of the governor, Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Questions asked, but seldom answered. These are one of the defining characteristics of Jesus' ministry, and Matthew 21 certainly is no exception. The chief priests and the elders were shrewd politicians, and they knew how to spring a rhetorical trap. What mattered to them wasn't the right answer, but instead whether the answer served their purposes. 
They couldn't make up their minds about how to respond to Jesus' question, so they simply said, we don't know. At which point, Jesus launches into a parable about a father and two sons. Not that parable. The one you immediately think of when I say a father and two sons. But, but this parable. A father who goes to his first son and says, I need you to go work in the vineyard. And the son says, yes, dad, I'll get right on that. And then fails to do so. Surely none of you have found yourself in that position ever in your life, right? Surely none of you have said, yes, mom, I'll do it at the next commercial. At the next time out. Right after I finish this chapter. Some of y'all read books. I know you do. Or perhaps after this drive. Or once I get through this boss or this quest on the video game. Only to forget. At least that's what my children tell me. Sorry, Dad, I forgot. I'm looking at them, don't worry. We find ourselves in this son's shoes more times than we would like to admit, if we're honest. But then there's this second son. This is the son who gets most of Jesus' attention in this parable. Unlike his brother, he initially says he won't help out in the vineyard, but winds up doing so in the end. Now we can ask all sorts of questions about why the second son changed his mind. Preachers and biblical scholars have been asking these questions for years. But just for now, let's sidestep that, that question and instead... Stay focused on the text that is before us. The truth that this parable brings to bear has nothing to do with the second son's hesitation and everything to do with the fact that in the end, he showed up. In fact, the pattern of this parable is the pattern of our life with God. God no matter what we've done, or what may have initially prevented us, God is always extending an invitation to us. We are consist consistently and constantly being drawn into a new place, into new depths of faith, to a new plane of divine discovery. No matter if this is the first time that we've ever heard the gospel or if we've been faithful Christians for decades, this parable lays bare one incontrovertible fact. God isn't finished with us yet. Although we might wish for God to say to us, okay, you've gone far enough. You can now retire and spend the rest of your years, the rest of your days, ensuring that the back pew doesn't get up and float away. The truth is that the baptized life has no emeritus status. In order to live into God's invitation, we must be willing to leave the past behind us. No matter how comfortable or how familiar or how profitable, we must be willing to turn toward the future, complete with all of its uncertainties and questions and anxieties and make no mistake, friends, that's hard. It's hard to leave behind the things that we know, that we trust, that are comfortable. Consider, for example, the chief priest and these elders. They had quite a bit invested in the status quo, didn't they? Leaving the past behind meant forfeiting their claims to power, their position in society. The, this had become their entire identity. And stepping into a life with Jesus meant leaving all of that behind in favor of a future that they couldn't predict a future that they couldn't control. One can't help but wonder if the first son had similar thoughts. After all, saying yes is the easy part, isn't it? Particularly when we don't pause to consider the costs. 
but actually doing the work, actually showing up, showing up, that's a different story. Friends, God isn't satisfied with just letting things stay the way that they are. There's always more work to do. There's always more kingdom to build. And we hear, we hear that and we get excited. And we say, yes, sign me up. That's what I want. But then reality sets in and we look around and we think, well, the status quo is kind of nice. I mean, if I'm honest, I got everything that I need, right? I got food on the table, a roof over my head. We're not doing wonderfully, but we're doing okay. Besides, who knows if I'm going to like the work that God is calling me to? And more importantly, who knows if I'm going to get along with the other people who show up to work in God's vineyard? So, I know I said yes, but I've had to think on it. And well, then there's the other son. And for as much as preachers and scholars have wondered why he changed his mind, I can't help but wonder what made him say no in the first place. Could it be that he himself had been told no so many times that he thought himself unworthy? When all you've ever known is oppression, why in the world would you trust that this time would be any different? But friends, God isn't like you and me. God doesn't take no for an answer. And although institutions and structures and people do their best to wall off and to box in, God is always breaking barriers and crossing lines and pushing boundaries to invite us to a new and an abundant life. The parable that Jesus tells is universal. It's universal because at one time or another, every single one of us has found ourselves in that thin place between the relative ease of comfort, of saying yes to God, and actually putting one foot in front of the other and walking along that rocky and dirt paved path to the vineyard. Friends, we're all caught somewhere in between the excited yes of the first son and the slow conversion of the second son. Much like the first son, we've all been fed one of the biggest lies ever be told in the name of Christianity that following Jesus would be easy. And much like the second, we all know what it's like to feel as if too much has been asked and that it's too far to go. But at the end of the day, one thing remains. There's more kingdom to build. And God has put out the call to all who dare to join. So I, I'm headed to the vineyard and I'll see you there. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn, Let Us, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ, hymn number 514.
Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated. Amen. It's the best time of service. Amen. The preacher's done. Amen. The food is probably ready. Amen. Uh, but the best time of service when you can give your time, your talents, and your treasures to the Lord. Amen. As the soloist sings, uh, as uh, um, uh, Pastor Mary taught our young people today, uh, each church uh, that's represented here has a basket. So find, if you have your tithes and offerings with you, you find your basket and you put them in. And now this basket right here is for our, our, our tray, is for our Midway Ministerial Alliance. If those of you that don't know, uh, we have one big, uh, uh, nice, uh, uh, a beautiful thing here in Midway that all the churches give and support the Ministers Alliance. And if some, uh, if, if there's a needy family or if there are needs in our community, the Ministerial Alliance steps up, Amen, and helps folks uh, with those needs. And, and we've helped the schools. We've helped all kinds of different things within our community, not just Midway, but the whole entire Woodford County. So find a little extra. Amen. After you pay your tithes and offerings to your church, amen, then deep down and find a little extra and put it in the Midway Ministry Alliance. And nothing is stopping you from giving to any of the other churches too. Amen. Hope y'all stopped at the ATM machine. Amen. And they all take checks. Amen. So as the uh, beautiful soloist sings, find your basket, uh, the appropriate one for you, uh, and give as God has taught you and wanted you to give. Amen? Amen. Amen. Offertory blessing, uh, doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Sorry. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above each heavenly host. Praise Him, Father, Son.
Blessed are you, Lord, of all creation, through the goodness we, we got given these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings to your glory and spread your kingdom. Amen. You may be seated.
We want to invite you to join us for a community potluck. It will be that way, right? That way in the, the fellowship hall here at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, receive this benediction as also a blessing over our meal as we go to gather together. Gracious Lord, as we gather as one community, one church, your church, we pray that the food that has been brought together would nourish our bodies. We give thanks for the hands that have prepared it. We give thanks in advance for the conversations, for the fellowship that will happen around your tables. As we go, Lord, we pray that you would go before us, beside us, and behind us. As we head to your vineyard, we pray that we will see you there and that we will be bold enough and courageous enough to answer your call and to do your work in God's community. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Go now in peace. Oh, my God.